welcome to Allen Street Online this week. We are so glad you're joining us. Let me just tell you, we are starting a new series that's entitled, How Are You Wired? And we're going to be looking at this subject of worship. And it's probably going to surprise you. So let me just kind of get right to it. Our worship team is coming. And let's worship, and I'll be back in a few moments.
Hey, welcome back. I, I want to interrupt worship for just a moment because I want to remind you that we have a digital connection card. And what that does is allows us to know that you are here. You can also submit prayer requests. You can request information with it. So if you would, text the word CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, to 660-885-2127. You're going to get a response back on your device. Click on it. And it will open up this digital connection card. And here's what I want you to know. We would love to be able to send you a gift for just being here today. Uh, one of them will be a book that my mentor put together, Nelson Searcy, called Unshakable, Standing Strong When Things Go Wrong. It's an easy read, but it will address some of the things that all of us face, struggles that we have in life. But we'd also love to send you another gift. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's just going to surprise you, but you will get a padded envelope. That's the cool thing. But let us know that you were here. You can submit prayer requests there. You can request additional information there at the connection card. And then also, anytime during the service or during the week, if you would like to return your tithe or give your offering, just text the word GIVE to 660-885-2127. The first time you do, it will take you a couple of minutes to set it up. You'll have to have like your bank account information or your credit card information, your debit card. But they will actually uh, connect your bank with you to make sure that you're approving it. It's safe. And then once it's set up, you'll be able to return your tithe, give your offering in a matter of seconds. And it's one of the safest, well, it's the safest way you can do it. Hey, thanks for letting me come back. I'll be back in a couple of minutes with the message. Let's join our worship team again. Sing. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word Throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. We're gonna praise the
that chorus, just lifting up that chorus, lifting up our voice to the Father this morning. We just want to praise you, Lord. Let's sing praise the Father. Praise the Father. Welcome back, and I just want you to know we're not walking in sunlight anymore. What do I mean by that? We are starting a brand new series, and I believe of all of the topics that we can find in the scripture, I think today's topic may have as much information as anything else, but I would also say as much misinformation and misunderstanding as any other topic we can look at in the Bible. Now, how's that for a setup? But listen, I want you to hear me very carefully because I'm convinced to the very core of my body that this series may be one of the most important series that you can be a part of. And the reason is, I believe this series and what we're gonna talk about has the potential to blow the hinges off of the door and open up a new chapter in your life. Because here's what I have seen in most Christians. Are you ready for this? We live with split personalities. Yep, that's what I said. We live with split personalities. So let me explain it. As a pastor, I tend to see the people like at my church and all that, always in kind of the same situation. And it's always like at church or in a formal situation. And they feel like they have to be on because they're around the pastor. And because of that, most of you, you tend to want to be quiet and reserved and you want to be almost what I would say dignified. And then I see your social media and maybe you've just gone to like a George Strait concert or maybe you're going to like see the movie Elvis. And and I know here's what I'm going to see on your social media. I'm going to see pictures of you. You're going to have the band shirt on. You are a groupie and you're going to be like hands up and your head's back and you're going to be singing and, and I'm looking at it. It's not even a Christian concert. And then I go, hey, great worship. Just wrong object. But it's not even just the non-Christians. We as Christians do it. Come on, men, women, we go to a conference and we are willing to throw all of our, uh, our, our just inhibitions aside. We will throw our hands up. We will do all of that. And then we come back home and we go back to that other personality. You see what I'm talking about? Having split personalities. And by the way, I tend to do it too. It is hard for all of us. But here's what we have to understand. We are wired to worship something. 
What we don't stop to consider is that, we're, we're, that we are literally wired to, without hesitation, show our adoration for the Creator. And what does it really mean to worship? And so here at the beginning of this series, I want to give you what I would call just my operational definition of worship. And here it is. Worship can be defined as, take a look, having an intense passion or esteem for a person, place, or thing. Having an intense passion or esteem for a person, place, or thing. In other words, we can worship God but we can worship a whole lot of other things. So in order for us to begin to learn what it means to worship, what I want to do over the next several weeks is we're going to begin to look at a couple of thoughts. And I would almost call them the big overarching truths and principles about worship. And here, here are two of them. What is worship and what is not worship? So, let's talk about what worship is not for a moment. For example, worship is not manufactured. It's intrinsic. So, now the question you got to ask is, what does it mean to be intrinsic? Look at your screen. The definition means belonging to a thing by its very nature. In other words, belonging to the essential nature or constitution of a thing. It means it's a part of who you are. Music does not make you worship. The preaching does not make you worship. You worship because at the very core of who you are is worship. But we suffer from a split personality. But here's the other thing. It is not reserved for a certain group of people. You say, oh, listen, listen, I'm just kind of a different. And I know all those people over there, they worship, but I just don't. Do. Wrong. It's at the core of who you are. We are wired for worship. And because of our wiring, we got to know how to do it and how not to do it. And here's what I got to do. I'm a people watcher. You will find it very difficult for me to carry on a conversation with you if you take me to the mall because I'm looking at people I just, I, I'm fascinated by seeing how people move about and react and all of that. And I see a lot of worshiping going on. Here's what I see. I see people, they get a brand new car and guess what they do? They worship that brand new car. Now they don't bow down to it, but they're like, oh, look at my new car. Isn't it great? I mean, I do it too. Or I see people worshiping like a dream home. I just got my dream home. This is where we're going to live forever. And how many of you know, 10 years later, you're under your next dream home. I see people worship like a certain look or a certain area or a certain like position or even a certain amount of money. The bottom line, there's a lot of worshiping going along, going on. But here's what you got to understand. Take a look at it. You cannot divorce humanity from worship. We're going to worship something. And here's why this series, and here's why I believe this is such an important series, is too much, too much of our worship is being wasted. Too many of us are wasting our worship. Look at, all I got to do is look at your calendar, maybe ask a few friends, look at your bank account, and I can tell you what you're worshiping. And we can say things like this, oh, I worship God, or I worship Jesus, or I worship at like Allen Street, but, you know, talk is cheap. Because worship is intrinsic. And here's what that means. It simply means this. Intrinsic simply means this. It's an all-encompassing activity. Worship should be a part of everything that you do because you're wired to worship. Now, here's something I want to ask you. Have you ever thought that, about this? Worship is a competitive sport. There is competition for our worship. 
Now, I really ran into this when I began to read the story about Paul when he was at Mars Hill with the Epicureans and the Stoics and all that. The Apostle Paul finds him in Athens. It's a city that is literally littered with idols. And as Paul began to walk around, he began to teach about Jesus and the resurrection and the Epicureans who were into pleasure and the Stoics who were philosophers and they were into self-discipline. They begin to get rattled by what Paul is teaching. So they invite this man of God to a place called Mars Hill. Do you know what Mars Hill literally means? It means the battleground of the gods or a place of competition. Now, let me kind of take an aside. When we read the Word of God, we often think, oh, Paul just showed up in Mars Hill. Everything is going to be different. And the truth is, we're going to see a situation where nothing really changes. Because a writer talks about Athens 50 years later, and he says that 50 years later, it's easier to find a God than it is a human at Mars Hill. Here's why. The population was only 10,000, and yet they had over 30,000 statues of idols that littered the sidewalks. And it was just like framed by the architecture of the, of the Pantheon and the Acropolis, and it was just this dazzling thing to the eyes but they didn't get it, kind of like today. But the Apostle Paul walks around and he's looking at all of these thousands of different idols and he notices one where the inscription says, to an unknown God. These Athenian men and women, they, they wanted to make sure they had everything covered. They had a God for everything. And just in case they might miss one, they had one that was inscribed to an unknown God. Well, Paul took that as an opportunity to capture their attention. And he gave these men and women kind of a microwave message. And what I want to do for a moment is just peer over the shoulders of Paul. And we're going to jump into his conversation almost mid-sentence. Here's what he says. Paul, wanting them to picture God against the background of all of these idols. <coughs> he says, he is the God, this unknown God. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands cannot serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. Now, it would have been very easy for Paul to just go in for the kill. But he gives us a lesson that I think all of us need to learn. Because how often as Christians is the first thing that we do is we start going after somebody where they're struggling. We start attacking the sin that they have and the problems that they have. And of course, it's not one that we struggle with, but they struggle with. And so rather than starting where they are, like Paul just did, we go in for the kill. Well, at Allen Street, one of our core values is this. We're going to be known for what we are for, not what we're against. And we are for Jesus. And we are for how Jesus described the greatest commandment when he said, love one another. Now, what Paul shares to us may not sound all that life-changing, but it was because it challenged everything that they believed his message made brilliant application by starting right where they are, the unknown God. Now, that word unknown is the root from which we get the word agnosticism, which literally means without knowledge. So guess what one of the claims of the Athenians were? They knew everything. So Paul, he establishes a bridge from this unknown God to where he's going to begin to talk about Jesus. And having established this bridge, Paul now begins giving the Athenians a dose of spiritual truth, first about God and then about themselves. And, and here's something we need to understand, and this is so cool. Truth about God should always help us understand ourselves better. Truth about God should affect us. 
So Paul knew these two groups. He knew who they were. He knew what they believed. And knowing who they were is going to help us to understand really what Paul is doing. So the Stoics. The Stoics were what we would call pantheists. And the Epicureans, practical atheists. So what is pantheism? I define it for you. Pantheism is the doctrine that equates God with the forces and the laws of the universe. Practical atheism is the view that one should just kind of live their life without regard to God, meaning not accepting, not rejecting a God. So Paul's declaration denied the premise of both groups, and he drives them to the truth by addressing the Epicureans' belief that God was absent and the Stoics believed that God was in everything. So what Paul is saying is, listen, as the giver of life, God is actively here, but he is not contained in creation. In other words, we could say it this way, he's not going to be limited by creation. God is not limited by creation. And then he lets them know this amazing truth that God is actually seeking them. You know what that is? Boom, that's a mic drop. And here's why. He's telling them basically that there is a search engine in our spirit. And we are going to grope and we're going to seek and we're going to try to find some person, some place, something to worship because we're trying to quench that desire that we have to worship something. We, it, we've just been going from one thing to another and, and we end up wasting our worship. And Paul was telling them, like, I, I'm just kind of sharing with you that the only way that you can truly find the answer to your worship need is when you're willing to bow your knee to God. If you're intensely passionate about anything else, you're going to be wasting your worship. He's reminding us that we have a split personality. Let me ask you this question. What's your Mars Hill? In other words, what is that thing that is competing with your worship? What is that person, that place, or that thing that you are worshiping instead of God. You see, the evil one wants us to like burn up a lot of energy and waste a lot of time worshiping because he knows that once we bow our knee to the true God, when we become in intensely passionate about him, things begin to happen. Things start to turn around for us. Priorities get put into order and our life begins to take a radical change to the positive and the enemy does not want that. See, remember I said worship is intrinsic because it's all-encompassing. It's, it's, it's essential. It's a core need that we have and like it or not, it's a competitive sport. Have you ever just stopped to ask yourself this question? I wonder why God wants to have a personal relationship with me. See, to ask that brings us face to face with the reality that we often turn our backs on God thinking he doesn't really need us. And here's what we miss, and it has everything to do with worship. See, God's sole purpose for sending his son to die on the cross for our sins and to raise him from the dead that was to give you and to give me the opportunity to move from wanderers to worshipers. That's what God wanted to do. And it starts with the very moment that we begin to trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's worship. It's an act of of worship and he desires us to continue that worship in John chapter 4 verse 23 he says this but the time is coming and indeed it is here now when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth the father is looking for those who will worship him that way now, here's, here's a great study. If you ever wanted to do something, I think, kind of fun, begin to search the Scripture and look for every opportunity where you will catch a glimpse of what's going on 
in heaven. What are they doing? Ask yourself, what are they doing in heaven? Now, the Bible is not referring to some great giant worship service where we got to like have a pipe organ and a, and a keyboard and then we're going to have a preacher preach to us for all of eternity. That's not what worship is. But in heaven, every activity, every thought, every goal will be perfect, but it will have behind it a passion of praise and worship for God. You see, the Bible actually talks, though, about another place, hell. And some are going to face a Christless eternity without God. Now, God does not send you to hell. We make that choice. It's our call when we reject Jesus Christ. But here's something we don't consider, and, and maybe it's going to give you a new kind of look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, because there it tells us that at that moment, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, those who are facing isolation in a, a Christless eternity called hell are going to remember forever that the very last thing they did before they were actually gone to hell is they bowed their knee and they worshiped God. They worship Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that even those, those people who didn't hit their knees before they died, in that moment, they're going to bow their knee to God. And the reality of eternity is this, that if you are passionless about worship in this life, you're probably going to spend eternity passionless in a Christless eternity. See, if we refuse to worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in this life, we're probably not going to worship him in eternity. And that is what hell is all about. But here's the deal. We're going to wish we had. Because the very last thing we do before we spend eternity in hell is to bow our knee and worship God. And so in this series, we're also going to spend some time, some time on a truth that, that comes front and center in churches. And, and Allen Street is, is one of those. We don't realize this truth. And here it is. Worship is not about us. It's all about God. You know, I, I remember growing up, I loved to play sports. I played football and soccer and tennis, but baseball was kind of my my passion. And the good news is my dad was my coach. The bad news was my dad was my coach. But all of my life, I, I learned to play baseball. I learned to play the position. I learned to hit a ball and throw a ball from my dad. And some of my fondest memories are on the, on the baseball diamond with my dad. And uh, of course, I've shared before, one of my favorite memories was we were in our backyard and, and my dad would pitch the ball to me and I was hitting it not into my neighbor's yard, but over their yard into a park behind me. And my dad got tired of it and he said, you hit one more over there and I'm gonna walk over to this peach tree, I'm gonna pick it up and I'm gonna rip it out of the ground. And I thought, mm, my dad can't do that. So he pitched the ball and I hit it deep, deep, deep into that park. And you know what my dad did? My dad walked over to that peach tree. He put his arms around it. He ripped it out of the ground and he tossed it across the yard. And in that moment, I believe this. My dad could do anything he said he could do. See, listen to me. When we truly know that our God is all powerful and he can actually change anything it will change your perspective. It'll change your perspective. And by the way, the other thing that I realized at that point is my dad could beat your dad up, just saying. But that's a little boy. But here's something that happened. A, a year or so later, our team won the bi-state tournament. We won for our age division, the Missouri-Illinois championship. And my dad got to nominate and, and appoint five people to the all-star game and he did not appoint me and yet I had the best batting average the best on base percentage I played every game I didn't have any errors and I'm like I am crying and I go to my dad dad why did you not choose me and my dad had this great excuse because I didn't want the people to think that I was playing favorites to my my son and I'm like you're not playing favorites I'm the best on the team I was a little problem at that point well here's what happened two of our players couldn't go and so they called and said hey listen 
we need you to come and we need you to play. Here's the deal though, my dad was not gonna be my coach. For the first time in my life, my dad was not gonna be sitting on that bench with me. We arrive at the field, it's a college field and there are literally thousands of people in the stands. And when I walked onto that field, I did not care a thing about those thousands of fans. I was looking for one person. I was looking for my father. And when we locked eyes, I got a little emotional as I thought about all the hours that he and I had spent playing ball. I thought about all the times that we traveled, all the things that we had done together for that moment. In that moment, I only cared about pleasing. I only cared about playing well, performing for one person, and that was my father. You see, that's what worship is. It's performing for an audience of one, and that audience is God. Well, by the way, if you want to know, I did perform well. I did play well. You can talk to me later. It was incredible, just saying. You see, here's what we need to understand. Church should not be a time when we rate everything that goes on. And you know what I'm talking about. Oh, that message was a four out of a 10. Now, I know around here, the problem is not thinking, is it a four out of 10? It's like, well, was it a 10, 11, or a 12? Just saying. Oh, that music was incredible. Oh, man, it made it brought a tear to my eye. It had a, a shiver down my back. I mean, it was incredible. Here's what we got to remember. It's not about you. It's about God. And here's what we should be asking ourselves. Each and every time we come to worship, is my performance, both in church and in life, is my activities, what I'm doing and what I'm saying, is it pleasing to God? You see, so often it's easy to shift the focus of our worship from God to what God does for us. And suddenly we think God is here for our benefit instead of the other way around. I, I love what I heard years and years ago. One of the speakers that I heard said this, we go to church and we order a BLT. And we get our BLT and we sit down and in our humanness, we sit down in our selfishness and we begin to munch on our BLT. Now what do I mean? We do this, bless God. God, oh, I worship you because you bless me. God, you just, well, man, you just bless me. I serve a God who blesses me. In other words, it's all about me. The L, oh, God, I'm going to worship you because you love me. God, you just love me. Oh, I just can't imagine. It's all about me. God, you love me. And the T, oh, God, God, I thank you that you take care of me. You don't let anything bad happen to me. God, I'm going to worship you because you take care of me. It's all about my BLT. I want you to hear me. Those things are true. God does bless us. God, God does love us. God does take care of us. But those are not what we worship. Those should be the things that drive us to worship the one who does bless us and who does take care of us and who does love us. And listen to me, if you don't think I struggle with it, and if you don't think we struggle with it, you are sadly mistaken because too often, here's what we think. We think that our worship is about, well, how did I sing? <clears throat> how were the harmonies? How did I play? I wonder if they got the message. I don't know how I preach. I mean, it's easy for us to do that. Oh God, you're here, but you're here to benefit me. And it's so much more than that. And let me just talk to some Christians for a moment. If you're a Christian and you attend Allen Street, listen, you should not come to Allen Street to worship. If you come to Allen Street to worship, you've missed it. What? Okay, preacher, how then should we come? Well, I'm glad you asked. You should come to Allen Street worshiping. Already worshiping. See, if this is the only time that you come and you worship, you are starving yourself to death. I have to worship. You need to worship God every single day of our life. 
Because yes, I'm commanded to worship God corporately like in Hebrews 10, 25. And yes, I, I come together with brothers and sisters in a local church to worship, but it should be an overflow of a lifestyle of worship. See, corporate worship should really be the cherry on top of the, of the whipped cream on top of the salted caramel mocha. That's what worship is all about. Let, let me just kind of see if I can help you how, see how this plays out. And, and this happens in every church I've ever been a part of. Every church that I've talked to people about it, not just Allen Street, but I'm talking every church I've ever been a part of. I hear people say this, well... In fact, let me just tell you, I heard it today. Somebody told me this. Well, I'm just not getting fed there. I'm just not getting fed. Now, listen to me. There are times that maybe what they were teaching is not feeding you, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about this. We're talking about, you know, not being able to feed ourselves. Because, see, when we say, well, I'm just not getting fed, you know what that's equivalent to? That's the equivalent of lighting up a big old billboard that says this, hey, oh, I don't know how to feed myself. I'm just a baby. I'm just a, my pampers are wet and, and I need some Gerber and, and I go to church and I have people feed me and I get mashed up beets and peaches on my face and, and, and I cry when my diapers are wet. Too harsh? Yeah, maybe, but still true because that's what we're saying. And I don't know about you, but listen, I like to eat more than once a week. That's what worship is. Worship is feeding us. I enjoy, in fact, research says you ought to eat multiple meals a day. Whoa, what a unique opportunity. Uh, ever thought about that? Eat a morning, an afternoon, an evening meal. But you know, once a week, my wife and I try to have one of those special meals. One where it's just the two of us and we can actually sit down and relax and enjoy the meal and enjoy each other. Hey, that's what worship should be to us. It's the same truth in our spiritual life. And when we come to know Christ and we're born again into the family, listen, we are babies, but then we learn to feed ourselves. And when we learn to feed ourselves, then we can come together and worship. And you know what happens? Everything begins to click and we realize we worship because God deserves our worship. When God looks at me as a Christ follower, you know what he should see? He should see his glory reflected in me. He should see his grace reflected back to him. He should see his majesty reflected back to him. He should see his sovereignty, his power reflected back to him because worship is not about me. Worship is about him. And worship is not passive, it is active. And here's why I believe we have a split personality when it comes to worship. We have carried the world into our worship. You know what I mean by that? We live in a spectator-driven society. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When we don't like something, we change the channel. We rate things. Oh, that was a good one. That was a bad one. Don't want to watch that again. Oh, I would never do that, right? And here's, here's our problem. We miss what worship is all about. You want to do a study? Here would be a great study for you to do. Begin to read the Psalms. And as you read the Psalms, begin listing the words that the psalmist used for active worship. I want to give you an example I'm going to take Psalm 100. Listen to it. Read along with me. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. Do you see him? It's words like shout and serve and come and know and enter and give and bless. 
Worship is active, and God deserves my worship. But here's the other thing, I desperately need to give it because every time I worship, it begins to put my priorities into the right place. And I begin to remember that I am not in control, never have been, never will be, but he is. I was writing this message. I was actually sitting in my camper at the Buxall campground with deer frolicking across the way. I could hear the gaggle of geese in the background, the sounds of nature, and this thought came to me. Look, look at your screen. What is God's biggest competitor for worship? What is God's biggest competition? What, what would you say is his biggest competition? And here's what I believe it boiled down to. Look at it. Ourselves. self Worship, our wants, our needs, and a whole bunch more. Worship is not about us. It's about God. And throughout this series, we're going to be focusing on the truth that worship is a lifestyle, a lifestyle we begin to adopt and we begin to live. And we can come to church and we can shed tears and we can lift our hands and we can kneel and we can sing, but... Listen to me, if worship does not involve life change, if worship does not transcend into our marriage or our dating relationship, if worship does not flow into our parenting and our skills and our our priorities and our thoughts and our activity and our vocabulary and the places we go, it's not real worship. We're missing it. So here is the big takeaway for today. Are you ready? Here it is. Knowing what I now know, how then should I begin to live this out? See, here's what I want. I want you to begin to declare war over your worship. I want you to begin to ruthlessly remove those idols which reside on your Mars Hill, those things that compete for that make you waste your worship. Are you willing to pray a high-risk prayer that says this, God, I want to serve you and worship you only. Whatever that means, God, change me to live a worship lifestyle. And when you do that, what you will discover, you will discover the true meaning and the true purpose and the true reality of worship. What's your greatest competition to worshiping God? What's your Mars Hill? What is causing you to worship your way, your, your, waste your worship? What is causing you to focus on you instead of the one who deserves your worship? Would you pray with me? Father, this is not an easy thing to talk about because we all think we know what worship is. We all misunderstand so many things. And it's so very easy for us to make worship about us. We ask you right now to forgive us for that. Help us to look once again at you. You are the object. You are the person of our worship because your son died for us. He rose from the dead. He paid our death penalty. God, you deserve our worship. So right now, right where you are, would you ask the Father to show you what it is that's competing with worshiping him? Just ask him to show you. And Father, whatever it is, we lay it at your feet. We really do want to move from wanderers to worshipers. We want to begin to trust you and to live for you. We want our worship to transcend into our life, to transform us, to be more like Christ. Because, Father, we admit our our lives are messed up at best. And we know the only way to begin to see you to heal it is to worship you. So, Father, we do want to worship you. We want to lay our life down before the cross and say we trust you. 
Perhaps as you're watching, you'd have to admit that you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. What I would love to do is I want you to pray this prayer with me. Would you say, Jesus, I do believe you are the Son of God, and you died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit and make me your child. And then just say this, thank you for saving my life, for saving my soul. Thank you that eternity is now mine. Christians, it's time to admit that maybe we've been doing some things wrong. Just say to the Father, Father, I'm going to surrender it all to you again because you deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's what I want you to do. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior or you would like to know more information about what it means to be a follower, would you text the word FOLLOW to 660-885-2127. You're going to get a link back. When you click on that link, it's going to take you to a page that's going to help you to understand the decision that you are making. But it also will give you the opportunity to fill out a little little form there. And I'd love to send you a copy of this book called The Next Step for Your Journey. Let the adventure begin. It's a book that I put together to help you to understand what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, for all of us, would you take a couple of moments and fill out a connection card? The way you do that is text the word CONNECT to 660-885-2127. You're going to get a response back. Click on it, and a digital connection card is going to come up. Let us know that you were here. Give us your name. Give us your address. Let us know that you were here this, uh, watching this service. And we would love, if you're a first or a second time guest, we're going to send you a gift just thanking you for taking the time to be a part of this service. You can put prayer requests right there. You can request additional information. Take a few moments to take a look at that. And then anytime during the week, if you'd like to return your tithe or give an offering, our online service is really funded by you. If you'd love to be able to support this ministry, text the word GIVE to 660-885-2127. You'll be able to set up the ability to give. It will take you a couple of minutes the first time, but here's what I'm going to tell you. It's the most secure system in the United States to be able to give money to an organization. Once you get it set up, it then takes you about 10 seconds to give a tithe, return your tithe, or give an offering. And finally, any time during the week, day or night, if you have a prayer need, something comes up, and you want over 100 people to join you in prayer, text the word prayer to that same phone number, and we will get that out to our prayer warriors. We love to pray with people. Well, let me thank you for being here. We're starting this new series, How Are You Wired? And we're looking at the fact that you are wired for worship. And I just just hope today's message helped you to understand some things about worship, maybe challenge some things that you've been taught But always look at the Word of God and make sure that what we're saying lines up. And I believe you will see that it is. I will see you next time. God bless you, and I'm praying for you.
Hallelujah, that will be. When he shall come with trumpet sound.